Hi, I'm Liz Powell. I'm the founder of G2G Consulting, which stands for Government to Growth. I'm going to kick things off today for our military medical funding webinar. We want to make sure that you are all prepared to maximize your participation in the MHSRS conference that is coming up uh, in just a few weeks. Next slide, please. Before we uh, get into details, we wanted to start with this disclaimer that the views presented are those of the speakers and do not necessarily represent the views of the Department of Defense or any of its components. Uh, the appearance of the Department of Defense or its components um, does not imply or constitute endorsement, and the Department of Defense does not approve, endorse, or authorize this company or its products or services. Just wanted to make sure that was super clear. Uh, this is the agenda of what we're going to cover today. A little bit about us. Uh, we want to get right into the government funding sources and systems that are out there and talk about MHSRS. Um, we're going to have a very special guest today, Scott Walter. I'm very excited. He is an expert on um, working with DOD, working with companies, helping to facilitate those relationships that help the warfighter um, as well as veterans. And he comes from the inside. He's got the inside perspective working um, in the Department of Defense. So really excited to have him join us today. We're gonna close out with some Q and A. Um, next slide, please. So just a quick, quick background on G2G. So as I said, I'm Liz Powell, the founder of G2G Consulting. I started 16 years ago now. Um, we've raised $528 million in non-dilutive government funding for our clients since we started. And we work with many in health innovation space, broader high-tech innovation, and then several nonprofits. I would say um, majority is in this health uh, space. And um, funding is always a top priority for startups and growing businesses, but then there's also coverage issues around CMS, uh, TRICARE, um, getting um, distributed throughout the VA uh, clinics uh, and centers. So we work in all those areas um, and try to open doors and develop relationships that can help facilitate the growth of companies and meeting um, important societal needs. So that's us real quick. Um, we are located in several places, as you can see. Capitol Hill is where I am. Greg is actually in Cleveland. Uh, Aditya is in DC with me. We've got folks in Columbus um, and uh, we do a lot of work in Boston, Pittsburgh and some other areas. Talked about the kind of work that we do, some of our affiliations. We work with a bunch of different um, state bio chapters over the years, um, ranging from Virginia bio to Ohio Life Sciences, previously was by Ohio, to Mish Bio, iBio uh, in Illinois, um, MD Bio Maryland. So um, we are very friendly with and really support those state bio chapters. Um, they can be really helpful for companies and uh, institutions. We've um, really developed a niche in, obviously in defense, we do a lot there. Um, previously, I had staffed the Armed Services Committee when I worked on Capitol Hill before starting G2G. Um, so we have developed a very strong niche in making those connections for Department of Defense funding for companies, but we've also developed a strong niche in women's health. And um, what's great is that there's uh, more and more interest and in funding sources for addressing women's health uh, research within DOD as well. So that's definitely a topic that we're seeing at MHSRS every year. Um, so I think that's enough about G2G and my background. Um, and with that, uh, We've got the government funding sources, um, which I think I'm covering this one too, actually. So this one uh, real quick lays out different sources of funding. So there's really four ways to get funding, legislation, grants, discretionary contracts or funding, and procurement. Um, so for legislation, we've worked over the years, G2G is a team of lobbyists. Um, so we work with uh, Congress as well as the agencies and DOD. And um, we have worked to help shape uh, legislation that then um, provides directives on certain activities around uh, health research, for example, or certain issues. For example, we created the rare cancer uh, research line within the CDMRP program in Department of Defense. But there's lots of things that you can do through the legislative process. A lot of members of Congress are eager to learn. And they have a lot of learning to do when it comes to a lot of health and science issues. 
Um, the second way is with grants, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Grants.gov is a great source. G2G has our own source with our monthly GBG report, Government Bioscience Grants Report, summarizes all the bioscience um, government funding opportunities, really well organized table of contents. You can go right to what you care about. So we put that out every month. And then every third Friday of the month at 10 a.m., we do a free call to go over the highlights of that. In fact, uh, there will be a call next week, um, Friday at 10 a.m. Um, so grants are definitely a good source. And then third, discretionary. So a lot of times um, agencies that either haven't spent at all um, or um, the submissions came in, didn't quite fit, or Congress sends over additional funding. There's lots of different reasons how, but there are sort of these additional funding opportunities. And then lastly, procurement, where you're just directly responding to a, a contracting opportunity. I would say for all of these, relationships are absolutely key and making sure that what you're offering truly resonates with what they need. You can't offer something that they don't want. So it's really important to develop relationships, listen, and, um, and then work your way to fit into one of these categories. And then at the very bottom, just to show the comparison of funding and why um, we focus so much on Department of Defense, it's pure numbers. They have the largest budget. Um, they spend a ton on research and they're very eager and support innovation. They want to bring the latest and greatest to our military service members. That is what they deserve. Um, they're very passionate about that. So lots of great opportunities with Department of Defense, but clearly others as well. So you can see the pie chart. There's, there's many um, agencies that we work with and we've succeeded in securing funding and collaborations with. So um, with that, I think I am done and passing it over to my colleague. Thank you so much. Thanks, Liz. Um, I won't hold too much on this slide, um, but I know you all are here to hear a little bit more about the Military Health System Research Symposium, or MHSRS. Um, so again, as has been alluded to before, this is the largest military medical conference of the year. Um, and it's going to be held in four weeks' time uh, from August 14th to 17th at the Gaylord Palms Resort and Convention Center in Kissimmee, Florida. Um, and so registration for the conference opened about two weeks ago, and it will remain open until the conclusion of the meeting. Um, and so I wanted to discuss to discuss MHSRS a little bit more in detail. Um, so again, it's the largest military medical meeting of the year, last four or more accurately three and a half days. Um, it is really well attended by uh, folks from various quarters, um, including from the DOD, industry, academia, clinicians, researchers, um, and, and other departmental health leadership. Um, there's folks from VA and specific program managers from various divisions and agencies as well. Um, if I remember correctly, last year, um, 2022, uh, represented the highest attendance that they ever recorded uh, with over 4,000 participants. Um, and so the conference is divided into a couple of uh, really broad topic areas, which are bolded and underlined here. So they include warfighter, me warfighter medical readiness, expeditionary medicine, prolonged field care, warfighter performance, uh, and return to duty. And there's also a distinct focus um, on women's so that is service women's health as well. Um, and so last year was partitioned into about 65 plus breakout sessions um, and three distinct poster sessions. Um, and so you can see it was a pretty big conference, nearly 400 oral presentations, over 1200 poster presentations, as well as a uh, couple of really important plenary, plenary sessions with um, key leaders and program managers at DOD. Um, the forum also provides the opportunity for vendors to highlight uh, their products and services in an exhibit hall, as is common with many conferences. Um, and so the key benefits of attending this meeting, um, even if your work and your product don't necessarily align precisely with any of the breakout sessions is um, it provides excellent networking and exposure to the system because it is a very complicated system. Um, being in all those meetings with high level leaders, um, whether they discuss the ongoing and emerging priorities of the DOD, the DHA and the military health system, it really gives you an idea of what direction these agencies are going in the coming year. It can really help you sort of frame your work so that it's better aligned with military priorities. Um, and so, again, uh, even if, just to stress again why this conference is important, um, 
you can really connect with people who can put you in contact with other people. That's really what this conference is all about. Um, even if someone is not, even if someone can't help you directly, chances are they know half a dozen other people in their network who can help you. Um, and it's really about gaining exposure. Um, and while it is at times the conference can seem a little bit overwhelming, the downstream awards of attending or uh, targeted participation are manifold. Um, and it does take time. And so we've been going, GDG has been going to this conference for many years now. And it's really, we've seen it really bear fruit for a lot of the groups that we work with, um, putting folks in contact with the right people at DOD and elsewhere. Um, so next slide, please. Um, I just wanted to delve a little bit more into some of the areas of interest and some of the breakout sessions I alluded to earlier. Um, around this time, the conference organizers published the full agenda, which is the primary guidance document for anyone attending. Um, as of this morning, it's not yet, not yet been published, uh, although I do want to um, sort of dive into some of the topics that we know will be covered um, at the meeting. Uh, the overall theme of this year's meeting is medical readiness for the future fight, uh, perhaps in alluding to the fact that the U.S. is expected to be facing adversaries that are near peer rather than ones that over which we have superiority. Um, in any case, um, some of these areas are pretty make perfect sense, uh, given that this is a military medical scientific conference. Um, things like antimicrobials for infections, response to TBI, battlefield burn care. Uh, just going into a little bit more detail on some of them. The second one, so uh, blood product technologies and things of that nature are of long standing interest in the military. As someone who worked in this space myself um, in, a, in my previous role, it's a really underappreciated fact that bleeding and traumatic bleeding are rank among the top causes of casualties for folks in the military. Um, and then the third bullet point, AI, machine learning, um, those who have been following the news know that we're really in the AI age. The military is no exception. Um, just one potential example in military medicine where they're looking to leverage AI, it's with vital signs monitoring, which is particularly relevant in uh, the field military medical space where you have a limited amount of resources and limited number of medics. So monitoring wounded warfighters using AI ML is one example of what they're interested in. Um, going down the line a little bit, I think the sixth bullet point, it talks about um, uh, extreme environments. I attended an industry capability session uh, a couple months back at Fort Detrick, and it really hit home how operating in extreme environments, uh, particularly those with extreme temperatures, is an emerging challenge for the military. The Arctic was cited as one such example, and I remember a speaker at that forum indicating how materials used in military medical care behave differently under cold temperatures and how procedures uh, such as triage are inherently different um, in that space. So just a little bit of a taster as to the sort of things that will be um, focused on at this meeting. Um, but yeah, I don't wanna belabor the point. I'll turn it over to Greg. Thank you, Aditya. And, and just real quickly, um, wanna thank Aditya. Um, Dr. Gurish actually joined our team a couple of years ago and he, um, helps lead our biosciences, and he's got a, a PhD, so he brings a, a unique background to our team. Um, and so I am Greg Kapkar, and uh, I have been with G2G for about six years now. And um, not only do I get to work with Aditya, but also others in our bioscience world uh, doing grant tracking and um, working with some great companies that are bringing life-saving technologies to market. Um, I also am honored to be able to introduce our guest speaker today, uh, Dr. Scott Walter, who I know have known for the better part of a decade, probably about half a decade now or so. And he and I have worked together. I worked with his team from the 59th Medical Wing with a company that uh, was bringing medical device to market around non-compressible torso hemorrhage control. Scott and I have connected at MHSRS. MHSRS before, and we were just at the um, Medical Biomedical Biodefense Warfighter Symposium in North Carolina. And um, Scott is the Director of Technology at the uh, 59th Medical Wing at the Air Force. He's in the Science and Technology Office. He has a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering. He's a level three acquisition certified, and he's a licensed professional engineer in the state of Florida. He also has a master's in public health. He has a PhD in business administration, uh, particularly around project management. So he, he really knows the ins and outs of this system. And he 
comes from the DOD world. He is a retired Lieutenant Colonel of 25 years, having served in the Air Force just recently, well, not recently, but 2014 retired. And he did publish, I've got a screenshot here of it. Um, he had something published in the Defense Acquisition magazine that was issued May to June of this year, and it's titled The Adaptive Acquisition Framework with a Commercial Development Pathway. And so I'm going to turn it over to Scott. He's going to go through three slides that he's given us permission to share from a larger presentation that he does publicly around partnering with Military Medical R&D Community 101. So without further ado, I am going to turn it over to Scott and I'll advance your slide, Scott. Well, thank you, Greg. And I appreciate this opportunity to share information that I've learned over the years. Uh, first off, though, I have to with that kind of introduction, I better not fail. And I'm not an expert because I, I think the more I know, the more I know I don't know. So if uh, maybe take it as a humble learner and, but I will uh, in every opportunity try to pass on information that I've learned over the years to help you so you don't step in the potholes that I did or that you can optimize your exposure, your experiences, especially with the upcoming MHSRS because it's a invaluable conference. and. While you're investing money in it, you'll get so much more out of it. And we'll pass on some tips on how you can optimize your, your experience uh, in the next couple of slides. And then really want to save a lot of time for questions and answers because I want to get to where we can pass on uh, and answer some of your more direct questions. So yeah, with this slide, I like to ensure that people are aware that there is a multitude of organizations within the Department of Defense that work on medical research development acquisition. And that one slide alone, it just, it, it doesn't even capture all those organizations. So with that framework, I wanted to make sure when you're down there and you're talking to people, just kind of make sure you, you kind of know who they are, maybe where they fit, because there's a variety of different customers. It, it might be somebody who works in medical logistics, who uh, their primary function is to identify cheaper, better, lighter, uh, smaller medical products that we can replace our old inventory and update and upgrade and provide new enhancements. Or it might be a laboratory researcher who or developer who would be working in, within your lane of area of expertise where you want to develop a medical product. And they might be a potential collaborator so where a CRADA might come in handy, a cooperative research and development agreement. And also, uh, another possibility is uh, customer is an end user and the actual end user is a clinician who um, knows that they need something. They often have trouble describing it and they'll tell you, I'll know it when I see it. And that's an old adage, but it's often true. So I mentioned the end user because sometimes the end user will turn to the medical logistician and say, buy that for me. And the medical logistician says, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how to get that. So that's, that's that triad of uh, different uh, end users and customers that you're working with. Or the end user might turn to the laboratory and say, does this really do what it says it's gonna do? Or does it perform well? Or, and that's where then bringing it into a laboratory, a collaborator with a CRADA or a commercial test agreement, and we can validate it. And so the end user will be more comfortable in making the procurement decision. And also with working with your companies, because uh, I'm going to foot stomp at every opportunity and tell you that the end user is the critical element, sometimes more important, blasphemy, I know, more important than funding, because they're, they're the type of customer, uh, end user can pull a project through a valley of death. And I, say, I should say valleys of death, whether it's regulatory, financial, uh, end user training, you know, whatever that problem is, they will throw your project a rope uh, and pull that project through that, that valley, valleys of death. So keep that in mind. Um, uh, on that previous slide though, I wanted to kind of highlight one thing that kind of uh, shows how those relationships are different and how they might have different priorities. Uh, down in the bottom right corner, you'll see under the Unified Com Combat Components, SOCOM. And SOCOM, you know, we all pretty much know what SOCOM, Special Operations, and they have some very unique needs and requirements. And I, just as an example, uh, using them, I've had where vendors are working with SOCOM and they'll sell product to them. 
And then they'll come out to the rest of the Department of Defense and say, we're selling product to SOCOM, you should buy it. And that priority comes in the prioritization comes into play because well, SOCOM, they have those special needs, which are pretty much similar to other medical units that are deploying or back at the state side. However, SOCOM, because of their unique and small nature, they only they may, may only buy 10 units. And then if you turn around and try to sell it to the army, the army says, well, I need to buy a hundred thousand and are you able to produce them? And can you meet my price point? Whereas SOCOM, they don't always prioritize funding because they're only buying a small number. So I wanted to highlight or use that example to kind of highlight how talking to different customers might give you slightly different perspectives and then trying to unify their priorities so you can develop a product that meets everyone's needs and you're commercially viable if, if possible to get those costs down. Because like I said, when you're selling to the army and they got to buy a bunch of them, they're, they're really concerned about the uh, price point. So yeah, if we could jump to the next slide, please. A couple of quick highlights, you know, it's already been mentioned and we'll probably hear it again is uh, aligning to a military need because you can't sell them something that they don't know about, that they don't need, or they, they don't have an issue. Um, unless you can communicate to them, this is gonna provide a capability and that's a key word that you'll hear a lot in four weeks. It, you won't hear as much medical product, you'll hear medical capability because that's, that's what you should focus on the uh, end in mind. And that's uh, sharing a vision of their vision of what kind of capability you can provide in that, what that medical product is gonna provide, not necessarily uh, the product itself. Uh, and I mentioned about getting on in the middle about getting on some type of medical uh, ECAT or a prime vendor list, because you got to make it easy for them to procure it. And that is uh, so they can turn to their medical logistician and say, buy it. And they go, oh, it's on the list. Oh, OK, great. So and asking those knowing that it's half the battle so that knowing that these are out there, you can Google search and you can find ways or talking to your end user or uh, a laboratory, whoever you're partnering with uh, to provide the additional information. Um, I mentioned Public Law 115-92. It gives the DOD supported projects more emphasis with the FDA. So whenever you're dealing with the FDA, and I would highly recommend, I've, I've heard a lot of companies that over the years tell me, well, we're going to engage the FDA when we're more ready. And there's some strategy behind that. But I would say if you do like a Q sub meeting, uh, you know, and that's where you just talk to the FDA and get some information, let them know that you're developing a product for the Department of Defense. And that should help. Uh, at least you'll get their attention. Because the uh, FDA is working with the DOD to provide that expedited reviews and emergency use authorization for life-saving products. Um, but lastly, also, Whenever you're talking to someone and you're talking about medical capabilities, make sure if you're putting into a proposal, always highlight that as deliverables because a lot of times, and I've been up at Fort Detrick and in one of my previous jobs where I'm reviewing proposals and you gotta go through these proposals real quick. You gotta get them prioritized, which ones get funded, which ones fall below the funding cut line, which ones get rejected. And a lot of times it comes down to, what am I getting for my money? Those decision authorities want to see uh, what, what are we going to obtain with the funding at the end of the uh, successful conclusion of the project. So uh, next slide, please. And again, these, this isn't an all-exclusive list. We're just covering some of the highlights. Um, and here's where I'm going to foot stomp it. Military end users. You got to find your military end users and uh, identify the organization's well, first off, working with um, people in the area of interest, and I mentioned if you're, uh, if you're at MHSRS, and we'll hit this in some of the questions, and you're talking to someone at their poster session, keep in mind that right now they're probably working for a laboratory, and that's their primary fun function and focus. So but they would also know who you could talk to as far as end users or people that could help further your involvement, awareness, and understanding of the military need. And I, I'll keep mentioning Kratos because 
Uh, that's part of what my office does here is the cooperative research and development agreements. And there's several varieties of CRADAs, but I wanna stress that the D in CRADA stands for development. So a lot of times that gets kind of kind of forgotten. Uh, the only limitation with CRADAs though, is that you can't, the government cannot use them to fund somebody. But other than that, can share resources, manpower, intellectual property. It's a way of making sure intellectual property is protected. Um, what's also great about CRADAs is, is uh, anybody can work with anybody. There's no limitations or problems with that in that if it's money that's being awarded from the government to uh, a private entity, it's got to be competitively awarded. CRADAs, not so much, not at all, really. Um, I mentioned them are really hit hard as the end users. Uh, whenever possible, just try to get, or I put it on their court, several end users, because well, one will give you one perspective in their priorities. Uh, talking to different services about similar capabilities would help you then develop a more universal product that uh, would be used by just, not just one service, but all the services. Now, Defense Health Agency is working towards that end of trying to unify those military requirements so we can get down to and, and provide an industry and academia and others a, a more comprehensive list of this is exactly what we need. But right now, we're still struggling with that. So you'll hear different priorities, different requirements. Uh, bottom line, though, is uh, end user interest. Get that. you got to have it. And it's sometimes better than gold. And that, that's, I think, the last slide, right? OK, thank, thanks, Scott. Really appreciate that. And I'm just going to spend a little bit of time on this slide, too. This is where we're going to bank the rest of today's session until the top of the hour at 1 o'clock uh, uh, Eastern time, where we'll do some Q&A. We've got some, some uh, questions that we do have from Scott, but we invite you as the audience to submit some. and. Um, uh, use your Q&A feature. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. So just bear with me while I make a transition here. And okay. So let's kind of stick with the MHSRS theme. And I'm going to invite um, uh, Aditya and Liz, if you can moderate or look for questions in the Q&A feature. But so Scott, MHSRS covers the broad spectrum of all topics related to military medicine and the military health system. What would be your advice to first time attendees in terms of navigating this conference? Well, first off, don't be... Um overly concerned, it's overwhelming to everybody from the planners to the presenters to the vendors, everybody is gonna be overwhelmed because it's so large, so big, you can't hit it all. There's concurrent sessions running uh, where you need to divide and conquer. But probably the bottom line is as soon as you can get that agenda, start studying it and planning out your, I know it sounds like planning a trip to Disney World and you wanna hit all these sites, but uh, it becomes really important with uh, developing a strategy to optimize your time there in that you know, finding uh, those sessions that you definitely want to attend. You know, there's the sessions sometimes the real popular ones will fill up quick. Um, you know, getting, so you're not, you don't want to get there and have to either stand in the back of the room or be shut out. And I've had that happen to me a few times. Um, let's see, just, uh, just plan your visit. Plan as, as best as you can to, to get in there and, and find the people that you want to talk to. And there's, we already talked about the plenary sessions and there's going to be the uh, two hour blocks that the highlight those two hour blocks of information that's going to be presented are based on abstracts that a moderator uh, put in a topic and then collected abstracts. So what you're going to be receiving is pretty much the best of the best. Uh, I, um, a, a moderator will get for a topic um, maybe 100 abstracts and they'll have to narrow, narrow it down to about 10 or 12. So you're, you're already going to be receiving the best of this. So uh, there's some more important information on which session. I think we're going to cover that probably in the next question. Yeah. So I, I will just kind of take this quick opportunity to remind folks that the official agenda has not yet been posted to the MHSRS um, conference website, and maybe um, between Aditya and Liz, you guys could put in the chat feature 
the link to the MHSRS registration. So we're monitoring for that to come through. Um, and then, uh, so you, you, speak about, you, you, spoke, you spoke about the session, Scott. And so how do the sessions and the conference facilitate potential collaborations with DOD? Well, there's an old joke with uh, MHSRS and all the previous versions of it from ATAC to each service used to have their own session. And that is more gets done in the hallways and in the breaks than is ever accomplished in any of the meetings or uh, any of the briefings. So keep that in mind and, 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 and work to make those contacts. I know Liz said it, but it's very true. It's all about relationships and where you can form those relationships. And they, in approaching people, they, they may not remember you. So it's always good if you have some information that you can impart with them, whether, and in, a lot of times I know it's just a business card, but if you have a one pager where you can kind of leave that with them. And then um, I would say probably another thing is following up with them where you can uh, get their information and follow up with them, give them a couple of weeks. When they get back, they'll have to get through all their backed up emails. And then uh, in your email back to them or your, your contact back to them, uh, be brief do what's what the military loves and it's called bluff bottom line up front where you in that first line you say we met we talked about this i proposed this and uh and where you can provide them that little snippet of information go oh yeah yeah oh okay you know versus don't make them look for it don't make them think about it um let's see while you're looking thing, at oh i was gonna, yeah. gonna say to build on that to say we what we say here is don't bury the lead, but I, I like <laughs> I like the military word of bluff. You know, uh, well after twenty yeah after twenty five years I had that beat into me to make sure that you convey that information right up front and in very concise format. Um, I was going to mention about proprietary information, government employees, uh, whether they be contract or civilians, and then military too. We're all bound by the Trade Secrets Act. And so if you have any proprietary information, you can share that with them, but it's critical that you identify it because that's where most leaks or more uh, information gets lost because it, we're not, we weren't aware that it was proprietary, so it wasn't protected. So um, a government employee can sign a non-disclosure agreement, but I'll tell you right now, they're practically worthless because they don't have it, uh, an, an NDA like a CRADA has to be signed by someone who has that vested authority. It, be, it becomes like a contract. And most of us don't have that authority to sign a, a contract. So you, you can ask them for an NDA, they can sign it, but just keep in mind, it's more important, it's critically more important to identify your proprietary information by marking on your paper or whatever you share with them so that they, they know that they are they're required to protect it. Okay, great. Great, great information. And I, I did think of another question or just a statement I wanted to make about participation in the conference that I just had a conversation with a company that was thinking of going and they were lamenting like, oh, well, we don't have enough money to do a booth. And we were really consulting them. You don't have to have a booth to, to no. make most of this conference. And in fact, if this is your first time going, don't waste five grand on a booth go and work the conference like you just described of going to mapping out the the agenda and who's presenting and getting to those sessions so um all great advice well and just to piggyback off of that every morning you're going to have breakfast in a a huge area where breakfast will be provided in the multiple serving lines and when possible if you meet somebody on monday or tuesday say hey uh, can i meet up with you Wednesday morning uh, for breakfast. And, and I think breakfast opens at like six, 6.30. It goes till like eight o'clock when the first sessions are held. That is a lot of, a lot of time that you could uh, meet up. And it's hard because the tables aren't numbered or anything. But if, if you can uh, describe where you're at and, or what you're wearing and they can find you, those are perfect, great times because they got to eat too and might as well uh, have food together. And food, you know, makes things go a little bit better. And the same thing with lunch. If you can, it becomes a little bit more hectic because uh, the timing is it's smaller and a lot more people at the same time. So it's harder to maybe meet somebody or meet up with somebody during lunch, but it can be done. But use those sessions and yeah. then go ahead. 
I was just going to add to that. Like we would um, do three hours uh, at breakfast time and just do like half an hour slots. And then inevitably you would see someone else or the person that you were scheduled to meet with brought their colleague, which was yet another great connection. So I just wanted to um, emphasize the value of scheduling those, especially breakfast, because I think you're right. It's a little bit easier than the lunch one, but either one. It's such a great way um, to have those in-person conversations that are just tenfold better than an email, right? It's just an in-person really connecting with someone. So highly recommend. I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, kind of sticking with this theme, uh, got a, we have a couple other questions that we just want to highlight some, some things for participants of the conference to really take note of. And then we want to open this up to, I know I see cute questions piling up here in the q and okay. And I think some are even piling up in the chat. So I'm going to rely on Aditya and Liz to help go through those. But real quickly, um, some features of the conference, like sessions, events, booths. What do Ready. you recommend? Can you kind of talk about those? Uh, Roger that. You know, I already mentioned, and it's it's more true than a joke about meeting up in hallways at breakfast and other sessions, uh, between sessions, uh, after sessions. Uh, unless you have a rental car, which is it's very expensive to have uh, parking there either at the Gaylord or some of the hotels or at the actual, well, Gaylord for the, where the conference is. Uh, Uber's, there's a ton of, because like, it's Orlando, Kissimmee area, uh, Uber's an option of uh, being able to meet someone at a restaurant that night. But with the sessions, you know, there's the plenary sessions where uh, thousands of people are gathered, uh, really hard to find people in those sessions, not as much uh, interaction. But then with the other sessions, like with the, breakout session, there's two hours, people are presenting information, you know, identifying that person that, that you want to talk to who's, who might be presenting their abstract or might be the moderator, you know, catch them at the end. And you you can only have probably a couple minutes, so there's going to be a line. But if you can at least exchange contact information and uh, maybe share a little bit about your, your product or your ideas and what you want to accomplish and, you know, a little tickler and then, you know, capture their information if you can. So you have that opportunity. And of course, you know, questions and answers that uh, are more just uh, not a good chance to interact. Um, but then with the poster sessions, there's uh, at least two, maybe three poster sessions this year. And that's where these researchers, uh, developers are presenting their ideas and not just military, uh, civilians and some uh, companies and small businesses and academia are presenting information. So when you scan through that agenda and if you identify ones of interest, you know, make it a point to go to that poster session. The poster sessions are great because there's a time where they're gonna have to be outside their poster and actually it's being judged. There'll be judges that come through and ask them questions, but it'll be a lot of available time to talk with them. And those are the people that like uh, Greg, you were saying, if they don't know who the end user is, they can refer you to someone who might know. So it's not just what they know, it's maybe it's in relationships again, like Will said, you know, getting to know them and then getting a larger community and finally finding that end user that is uh, precious. So that's another opportunity. Great. So I'm gonna save our last kind of uh, question around your insights, because I'd like to close with that uh, before we close the webinar to finish with your kind of insights and last words. So- hey, Greg, there was one thing I wanted to make sure I mentioned. Yeah. Um, and that's, there's a lot of booths that you may not be familiar with, but they're critical. And that's like CDMRP, Commercially Directed Medical Research Program. They'll probably have a booth there. Uh, go by there, get their context, get their information, because that's where a lot of funding goes through that, goes through the MRDC, CDMRP, and a lot of programs that are funded through that. So there's going to be these booths that we kind of ignore. They don't have, they may have candy outside or free pens, but they don't have cool technologies. But those, those can help, especially some of the foundations, because foundations, they're, they're all built around relationships. So Geneva, HGF, Metis, you know, having those contacts in your, I was going to say Rolodex, but uh, in your phone, it gives you those additional contacts for information. So if you don't know, you can reach out to these people. They probably know. So thank you. Yeah, Take that's the a minute. Yeah, you know, that's great. And I'll just say, as far as acronym soup, we were in North Carolina a month ago, and the DOD is notorious for acronyms, and we're all guilty of it. So if you're new to it, CDMRP is Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program. Um, and Liz talked earlier about legislation and appropriations. 
all of those funds are congressionally directed. So they get direction from Congress as to what to spend this DOD specific research on. Um, and then MRDC is the Medical Research and Development Command out of Fort Detrick, and they've got locations all over the place. So if you're new to this space, just kind of get comfortable with the fact that we'll all be shouting out some acronyms here or there. But with that, let's turn it over to Liz and Aditya. If you can guide us through some of the questions that are, are I see really kind of uh, sure. people have an interest in. Yeah, so I'm seeing some good uh, questions I bet a lot of people have. So one is clarifying the value or difference between $400 versus $700 ticket for this conference. In other words, going just one day or going for the whole conference. And then somewhat related logistic is how do you set up these meetings? We're getting a few questions on that. Like how do you actually set up that five minute coffee meeting? So could we answer those? If I could, I'll jump in. The first day is a lot of plenary sessions, overview. You get a lot of information from uh, DHA and a lot of vision. So getting out agenda, and if, if that's what you want, then of course you won't be there that day. The sessions really start to start to kick off on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. Well, Tuesday and Wednesday, and so that's that would be your justification for one or two days is what your primary intent is. And then uh, when you can go up, let's say someone's presenting, and then at the end there's a line people want to talk to them, or you can go up to them and say, "Look, I know you're busy. Can we have breakfast tomorrow? Say 7:15. I'll wear a blue shirt, or if I have your phone number on, you know that, and that that would probably be." One of the easiest ways because then they're they're not feeling pressured. They probably also have some things they want to go to the next session or meet up with other people. So they may not have the time to talk to you right then. But if you say, "Oh, hey, that's fine. Um, how about you know breakfast tomorrow, seven seven fifteen? And, and they're probably going to go, "Yeah, sure," because a lot of people don't see that as a value of of being able to schedule meetings in the morning with breakfast and meet up at a certain time. And I'll add something just to that, uh, Scott, is to reemphasize something you said earlier about coming with like a one pager and really honing your message down to here's putting your, your bottom line, you know, putting what do you have to offer? So what is it you want to accomplish? Putting it in a one pager and a, and a leave behind and um, absolutely working it, having, you know, sitting at tables that you don't know people and, and conversing that way. And the other thing, too, is if um, sometimes some of the leaders of DOD will fly in just for, the, say, the first day. And if you're talking right. with, with their staff, so they're going to get bombarded on the, on those first days. But if you if you can get to their staff assistant who's usually at their side and just say, hey, want to give this to you. Um, can I can I connect with you after the conference and can we set up a, a virtual meeting or TCON teleconference um, in a couple of weeks? So it doesn't end at, at MHSRS. You can do a lot of follow-up. Nice yeah. Roger that. Or if you meet with them and they're like, oh, okay. You say, but if you have someone I could meet with, you know, please let me know or please let them know. And here's my contact information. Yep. Other questions? Yeah, Scott. Um, I think Greg can also shed some light on this. Um, What's the scope for foreign companies? Um, I think one person said that their group is based in Israel to do business with the DOD, or are they eligible for certain types of DOD funding or other types of collaboration? Could you guys speak to that? Well, I, I can hit with Kratos because we do work with a lot of Israeli companies, UK companies, Canada, and we have to enter in what's called the non-domestic Krata. And it just goes through an extra layer of security or review. Um, when it comes to funding, those those are probably more difficult questions. You need a contracting officer. Uh, you know, a lot of times you hear the buy American, and then there's some requirements in some of the procurement contracts. Um, I would say having a distributor in the United States definitely helps. I mean, I'm, I'm, and oxygen is important to life. Okay, <laughs> I'm telling you the obvious, but uh, those those kind of workarounds uh, definitely help. Or partnering with someone and someone who who uh, you know, is a U.S. based company or has those, but yeah, more global, you know, we're, and the DOD is open to that because we want better solutions. And there's a lot of, like, um, a lot of y'all probably are aware that we're currently buying French frozen plasma, French freeze dried plasma as an interim until we can get a U.S. based product. And it saved a lot of lives. It's so common. 
and SOCOM is Special Operations Command. Um, sorry, yes. Okay. Down. <laughs> yep. Headquarters down in Florida, Tampa. Thanks. Other questions from our audience? Yeah, so there's a good question. I bet a lot of people have this one too. They have some gadget or device or some kind of demo that they'd love to do if they can just grab people between sessions or maybe go up and talk to the speaker at the end of a session. What's your advice on that? Can you do that? Um, is that well received? Any advice for that? Well, I've attended several impromptu demonstrations, technology uh, demonstrations out in the hallways. And there's some tables, they don't have a lot, but where you can secure a table and then text the folks that are interested in a, a time. And, uh, and I've never seen the hotel staff put up any kind of resistance. They'll just walk right by. So it's, and I can't speak for hotel security, but I, I can tell you I've, I've, I've participated in those. We've never had any issues. So a bit impromptu, but sometimes that's, that's the best because then you get some of those questions that you weren't expecting that help help guide the development of your product. And, and the, the hotel is huge. There's so many large open areas available. Um, okay, looking again at the list. Um, let's see, answer that one. So this one is sort of pertaining to work that they've done with the VHA. So if you've received grants from Veterans Health Affairs, the Veterans Health Administration, and you're ready to move into commercialization, uh, we have been approached by a company uh, to add to our existing, to add their product to an existing master contract um, that they believe will reduce ramp up time. Um, is this an accepted practice in, I think I'm assuming they mean, is this accepted practice in DOD as well, or is it something that um, is limited to V to the Veterans Health Administration? Uh, I would encourage it in more on the DOD side because a lot of times uh, working with, and the, the Department of Defense has a unique system. It's for a development and acquisition, and it's called the Defense Acquisition System of all things. But it's, it's a system that was designed to develop F-16s, bombers, fighters, lasers, ships. It was never designed or developed or even intended to be used for commercial products. But it's, it's kind of like all we have right now. So the Department of Defense runs projects through that and it just adds incredible delays. And it's something that we've struggled with for at least 50 years now. And that's actually something I reference in the paper. And thank you, Greg, for bringing up that paper of the problems associated with that. So when you can find someone, a partner who kind of understands the ropes and can get your product commercialized faster, it's probably going to be cheaper because you're not spending as much manpower and labor and, and getting into a system where like the uh, ECAT or the medical prime vendor list so that it can be easily procured. That's, that's just gold. And I'll go ahead and put a plug in. Uh, there's a a monthly meeting held at Fort Detrick. It's um, a vendor day and it's MHS vendor day. And it's held like nine months out of the year, except for the winter months. And then August when they have the primary uh, attendance is at MHSRS. And those are free meetings where you can bring your products in and demonstrate them. It's like four hours. So just Google uh, MHS vendor day at Fort Detrick. And Scott, uh, along those lines, are they still requiring that uh, companies who want to participate submit a new product idea, the NPI submission to, to be invited and to be able to come to Vendor Day? Isn't that still the, the avenue to get into those? Uh, no, that's a separate. Uh, the new product idea is, uh, and it's really not limited. I mean, the new product idea is really for, I got an idea, would this work? And you can submit an idea They'll protect your intellectual property and give you feedback on it. So it's more for early development, early yeah. considerations, because they'll, they'll help direct you to someone who might be interested or a laboratory that's already working in that area or tell you, now nah, we're not interested, which is 
good information to know before you invest a lot of time and money in it. Yep. Uh, Scott, you mentioned the paper. Is it okay with you that I, can I send a PDF version of the publication uh, out of the defense acquisition included in our follow-up in the email? Do you mind if that gets shared widely? It depends how much will I have to pay you? No, I, I appreciate that because I, I am really just trying to get information out on how we can do business better because I, I know that our future is different processes like prize competitions. I foresee in the next five years, we'll have prize competitions as a way of uh, stimulating industry, academia to partner with each other, with nonprofits and develop a product that we can come along and go, you win the prize, now you get the contract and we'll buy them from you. So then right. that's just one of many opportunities that right now we're really limited to contracts and grants, but there are so many other possibilities. Great. I'll, I'll send that. We can send that out. And just for the record, there's been no quid pro quo or money in Japan <laughs> than having you attend or participate in our webinar. <laughs> um, what other questions do we have from the from the audience? I see a question that I love, um, something that we address all the time, and that's dual use. And so when we approach the military, we want to make sure that we're bringing forth innovation that truly meets your needs and your requirements, as the military always says. But the dual use application, in other words, for civilian population, is also really attractive. Um, so how, what's your advice for folks that are trying to be in both? How do they present that to DOD? Um, just any other tips for that? That is a great question because that alludes to what I said earlier about selling product to the special forces. And they only buy 10. So price point's not really a question. And then you, you step it up to Army, who's the biggest uh, procurement uh, of medical equipment and technologies and products, and they price point isn't is probably the most important because if they can't buy ten thousand, then uh, we can't standardize it and really can't use that product. So the way and you know if you're working with a small business innovation research project, a uh, SIBR, then you have to have dual use for that technology that product that you're developing. But what I, I, I know the basis of this question, and that is affordability. When you can sell to the public and not create the military version, then you're going to make more money. And if you make more money, the DOD benefits because we'll get a better product and you're, you'll have the financial capital to reinvest and develop the Mark II, the more uh, universal, uh, smaller product. And so you're, you're upgrading it. We're not just doing a buy-off, which is what... We do sometimes with the defense acquisition system. We'll do one product, we'll build it, buy it. The company doesn't sell it anymore. They go out of business and then we have a product and it's, now it's outdated and what are we gonna do? So yeah, absolutely positively, but there's one key and that's uh, look up the, the initials MVP, minimally viable product. When you can produce that minimally viable product that meets the military need and the commercial need, then uh, you're, you're, hitting the, you're hitting the target at the bullseye because you're producing what they need, not more than what they need. Because sometimes the end users, they won't know and they'll ask you, can you put a cup holder on it? Well, that'll drive the cost up. Oh, okay, well, no, no, no. You meet both needs as best as you can with one product and then uh, everyone will benefit as a result. Scott, I can't remember if I've heard this from you or you said it earlier in your comments, but I, I know I've heard this a couple of times and that is that that the DOD is not flush with money. I mean, we saw their budget. They've got a huge budget compared to other departments within the government. Um, but a lot of that money is uh, spoken for, whether it's overseas or with specific buying of weapons, all of that. But that companies who come to DOD thinking, I'm gonna get rich if I just get DOD as a customer, that the DOD wants companies to be flexible and have a broader market than just the DOD. And maybe I'm speaking more around like the, the medical type of, uh, of, of research, but does this resonate with you at all? Am I, am I on the mark? Or am I not? You guys just tell me where to send the check because this is an incredibly important question and uh, complex problem that we got to address uh, because um, gosh, where do you even start? But with, with building products, you know, and getting the customer 
customer, meeting the customer's needs, minimally viable product, and uh, meeting the uh, commercial as well as the military need. I, the, the reality is when the DOD funds something, we're, we are, we do have a lot of money and a lot of it, on, it goes, it's researched. So if you were to do a comparison, it's probably at least a 10 to one uh, financial discrepancy between all this money that we put into research and all this little money that we put into development. And then what you just said was important, the development money is programmed for specific projects or programs. So when we when you see a funding opportunity, most of the time it's, it's for research. And so where you can augment your development dollars with venture capitalists, with uh, partnering with a larger company or uh, private investors, you know, finding other sources of funding because it's so hard to get development funding as I mentioned, it's already programmed years, years out. I mean, talking four, five, six, seven years out, that money's programmed already for specific projects and programs and technologies. So if you come up with something that's great and you bring it to the DOD, they're probably going to struggle. From, even if they, they, I got to have this, they'll struggle with funding it because they got to find money from other places. And also they, the DOD, you're more likely to get selected for funding if you're coming in with funding because it deals with risk. And if you're bringing in funding, all of a sudden the risk levels go down. They're like, hey, you know, we're, we're providing seed money. That's, that's probably gonna be our future where we can provide seed money that helps leverage other funding from, like I said, venture capitalists. And, uh, and, and it could be even from foundations like Bill and Melinda Gates uh, providing funding. I mean, just a variety of funding sources. The funding sources that the DOD cannot tap into because we got our budget and that's what we got to spend. We can't go and ask uh, Bill and Melinda Gates, hey, you want to fund a, a freeze dried blood effort? Well, we'd probably get slapped pretty hard. Yeah. So I know we're going to have a few minutes left here while, while we, I want to make a transition to one last slide. So that's up. So um, just to the audience, excuse me while I do that, I'm going to share my screen and go to a slide. But Liz and Aditya, were there, was there one last question before we give Scott uh, any, the final kind of insight? Yeah, um, sort of to your earlier, at the point you were just discussing there, Scott. So we have uh, someone in the chat who's mentioned that they have a technology for treating PTSD. Trials, initial trials have gone well, but it's not FDA cleared. So they are sort of looking for money for, for that kind of trial. So given the points that you just discussed, like how can you use this conference sort of get help in that and moving forward in that direction. Um, both uh, some of, yeah, go ahead. No, uh, and real quick, awareness of your technology, uh, getting it in front of other people, getting it evaluated. And I would say uh, it, probably the best step is to find someone you can work with, a collaborator, uh, either a military lab or a university lab. And, and once you build that collaboration, you can submit for, and I hate to say it, submit for additional research funding but then leverage some of that research funding to develop a bigger program. So uh, uh, it's highly critical getting your technology in front of our people, getting it awareness, interest, sponsorship, uh, and where somebody goes, I want that technology. Man, I saw what it could do. I, why can't we have that? Get them mouth watering. They want it. Great. Whenever you can, wherever you can. Great. So, um, Liz, any last insights from G to G before we give uh, Scott kind of his final insights? Or should we do it the reverse? Do you want to have Scott go and then you do? Go ahead. Yeah. Closing? Yeah. So, Scott, go ahead. Give give your kind of final insight tip for making the most of MHS for us. What's the, the top tip? Well, take copy that. Uh, despite the fact you're, it's a working conference and you're going to be sweating and working most of the day and making contacts, try to have some fun because there's so much to do around that area where you can uh, get a little bit of enjoyment out of it too, uh, I would say is important. And it, I hate to say, that's a reason why it's held there, but uh, to get more people to come participate and then enjoy some of the benefits, but uh, definitely all about relationships, make some, make them, find them, build them wherever you can. Oh, and hit the vendor area too, because sometimes your best collaborator might be one of your competitors. Great advice. So Liz, do you want to bring us home as we close this out? Yeah, I think that 
just emphasizing, reiterating a lot of what's been said. This is phenomenal networking opportunity. It's a great chance to get the lay of the land, sort of landscaping of what's out there. What are the priorities for the military and the VA? Um, what are the funding opportunities? Developing these relationships in person, which is, we all know, so much more valuable than over email. Um, so for all those reasons, I really encourage folks to go. I also encourage you to register now, um, get your hotel room now because they will fill up. Um, I know Gaylord is already full, so you cannot get that hotel, but there's other good hotels around. And if you have other questions you wanna discuss further, we will be back here again next Friday, 10 a.m. We're gonna be talking about bioscience grants and we're also gonna talk about MHSRS. So we welcome your questions, we're here to help and I hope to see you at our booth and at the conference uh, in a few weeks. Just one minor correction there, Liz. It's this Friday, not next Friday. Oh, as in a few days from now. You're right. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank All you right. for this opportunity. Y'all take care. Travel safe and have fun. Thank you. Bye. Bye.